Welcome to EcoSY. Today we're going to be talking about creating supply chain agility through software with Ira Serenian, the Vice President of Product Management at Plex. So how are you doing today, sir? I am doing really well, Chris. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here and, and, and learning from you today. I know you have a ton of wisdom to share. So maybe start off by painting a good picture for our listeners out there. When you talk about supply chain, Ara, you know, what does that look like for manufacturing over the past few years? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a number of ways to look at it. So the supply chain just gen generically is the process of converting or, or procuring raw materials and transforming them into finished goods and getting them to whoever that customer is. So it's the link of all these activities uh, from procurement, production to shipment and so on and everything that comes in between. So, you know, as you can imagine, these last couple of years have been absolutely chaotic. It's yeah. literally there's been one problem after another, just hitting manufacturers. Um, so, you know, clearly the pandemic is something we all know about. Um, and, you know, what these types of events have really caused um, and is continuing to cause today is uh, this constant um basically cycling of demand and supply, where demand and supply aren't in, in complete synchronicity and synchronous with one another. And in doing that, it's creating a term that a lot of people talk about this bullwhip effect that sends shockwaves through your supply chain. Mm -hmm. So if you are the end consumer and you're looking for goods and it's going through the manufacturing and supply process, um, what that bullwhip effect does is these small changes in demand cause these huge issues throughout the supply chain. And mm -hmm. when you combine that with shutdowns, with ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal, um, a, issues with climate, um, a, you know, and, and so on, um, what happens is that lack of connection and um, flow of information and materials up and down the supply chain create a lot of chaos for people. Mm. Um, and one of the best examples I like to share is the chip shortage. Yeah. Um, and it's a it's an interesting story because it's still plaguing companies now, though it's not as bad because a lot of the, the supply has um, is slowly catching up with demand. But if you look at the chip shortage, and, and I, I like this example because it really captures a lot of different things. So at the beginning of the pandemic, there were all these shutdowns, right? Manufacturing shutdowns. Um, and as those things happened and people started to end up staying home, a lot of the way consumers um, were looking at the market and what they wanted to buy shifted. So it shifted from buying a car to, say, buying electronic device. You, you know, wow. your Sony PlayStation, a computer, anything that entertains you at home, televisions, things like right. that. Yeah. So the chip manufacturers saw that and they shifted their capacity to consumer goods. And the, one of the reasons they did that is they have really big um, profit margins um, in, in those goods. And then as the automotive industry started to come back up, what happened is when they started to issue their orders, the chip manufacturers were like, hey, um, we can't support that. Um, and uh, we don't have the capacity, all that allocated capacity went that way. And that gap in time from when they shifted, and you can imagine, you know, a foundry, there, there's tooling required. They just can't shift on a dime, right? They just can't yeah. expand capacity. And that really caused a lot of the issues we're seeing today and affecting anybody that has sells any device that has a chip in it, um, uh, you know, from vehicles to industrial equipment and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're a supplier anywhere in that chain, you're suffering from that. Right. You're trying to get goods to meet demand and you can't because there's all these constraints um, and there are a variety of constraints, which we can go through later. But so that sort of, I, I hope, paints the picture of the challenges a lot of uh, folks are facing um, within yeah. their supply chains. 
No doubt. It definitely does. And I mean, it definitely speaks to some of the weak points that we have in supply chain as well. And kind of dovetails right nicely into what I know you want to talk about today, the importance of software driven solutions to really impact that supply chain. So, you know, how, how does that, how do you see that manifesting? Yeah, no, absolutely. So look, um, the, the fact is no software, there really is no, no magic bullet that solves all these problems, right? But what software does inherently well is the ability to consume lots of data and make that data available to um, provide um, the, the basis for informed decision making, right? So in supply chain, there, there's two components. There's the demand side and there's the supply side. Um, and what I often say is that often it may be easier to, to address demand uncertainty than it is to address supply uncertainty. And, and the reason I say that is, so let, let's look at the picture. So what software allows you to do is to, um, a supply chain planning solution in particular, allows you to do is project out what you, the demand profile will look like for the, your customers and market you're serving. Um, there is a lot of rich information available to anybody within their supply chain whether you're right at the point of sale all the way through to being, say, a three-tier supplier somewhere in that supply chain. But by projecting out what demand is, looks like, you can then establish sort of bands around you know, what a high demand could look like, what a low demand look like, as well as what how volatile that demand profile looks like. And that helps you size your inventory requirements, right? your capacity requirements, your labor requirements. So once you have that understanding, what software allows you to do is then understand based on what you're projecting for demand, how well your supply chain can meet that demand from an inventory standpoint and so on. It then facilitates that decision-making that says, can we meet that um, or not? And if we can't, what are we going to do about that? So imagine doing that in a spreadsheet, which most companies end up doing. Um, they have to take all these different disparate pieces of data, put them in a spreadsheet that becomes enormously complex to manage, um, and more importantly, makes it very difficult to change, um, you know, to react to the changes that occur in the market. And um, so it really facilitates decision making by providing a platform to which demand and supply can be connected seamlessly, where all the data inputs come together and drive this idea of continuous improvement in your processes, where you can improve error management, you can identify supply chain weaknesses and address those, for example, going to an alternate supplier or trying to reduce lead time by bringing in manufacturing, say, um, domestically. So if you're in the U.S. and you're buying from China, maybe there's an option to do things in the States, thereby reducing lead time. So it really facilitates these, these decisions that in turn drive you know, better service levels to customers, more optimal working capital um, results, uh, reduced inventories and so on. Right. I mean, I can definitely see the picture a lot clearer, particularly on the demand side with that. Hour. But I'm curious on the supply side, does that, does that, what does that exactly look like? Is that suppliers directly connecting their ERP systems and, and inventory systems? So to, to those manufacturers that, so they can understand what those hurdles potentially could be. Yeah. So, um, okay. they could, right. So, and it's interesting. They could, but a lot of companies don't necessarily want to, um, because one of the fears I think, and, and this is sort of an interesting point, is if, if you're a supplier in the supply chain and your performance isn't good, why would you, say, share your data and your poor performance with your customers? It could put you at risk. But it's really all about relationship building, in my point of view. Right. It, it, it really is about having the trust between the proper and the different 
the customer and the supplier to try to, um, you know, through shared information, improve everyone's performance. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if, if I'm a um, customer and I'm relying on a supplier and I'm able to provide a platform to which data can be shared. And if I in turn share my plans with my supplier and my supplier openly shares their response to the plans, not to hide things, but openly identify where the potential gaps are and work together, that establishes a better bond between um, customer and supplier. And that bond and that improved relationship can drive those improvements that everybody wants because everybody wants to make money throughout that supply chain. And right. if there's ways to share data and information that makes my ability to react and meet the needs of my customer better, why wouldn't I share and say, uh, provide a link between the different systems? So that's where this idea of, you, you know, this a multi-tier optimization where you're connecting all the tiers together and having a flow of data up and down the supply chain um, becomes uh, an important idea. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes only the really big companies can dictate this through the supply chain. But I come from the point of view of if we're sharing things and we're open about where some of our challenges are, everybody's in a much better position to um, accommodate those those challenges in a much more financially meaningful manner. Right. Sounds like there needs to be a pretty high level of transparency and trust. And, that, and that's yeah. all, it's just going to grow. The more transparent, it sounds like the more trust is going to grow. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, trust is an important idea, right, in business. Yeah. Um, and. You know, in the old days, uh, you know, maybe going back to the 80s and 90s, I'm, I'm dating myself. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of trust. So a lot of, um, say, even the big companies in automotive and other industries were just focused on bottom line. So they didn't really worry about relationships. And I remember really well in the early 90s, mid 90s, how many um, companies, manufacturers went out of business in the States because the, the customers are driving lower costs, lower costs, lower costs. And um, they reached a point where they couldn't um, support those costs anymore and thus ended up going bankrupt. And these guys moved to China, got the lowest cost. But now everybody's questioning that because Going to China with, um, you know, tariffs and incredibly long lead times, is it really worth it? So, you know, companies, and this is where software can help, is to say, if I'm able to reduce my lead time, right, by looking at a domestic supplier, even though the cost may be higher, what am I gaining in return? I'm gaining the ability to reduce my inventory. I'm better able to react to changes. And, you know, in doing that, the data that is now shared becomes more reliable because it's a shorter time frame to which you have to plan and adjust. Right. Right. Instead of having had that, that, that longer type of, of, of window, you can narrow that down a lot more. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I, I'm curious from a supply chain process standpoint, I mean, you've mentioned several of them right now that, that, that really are impactful from my standpoint. Are there any other like best practices that manufacturers should be taking to really improve that supply chain process overall? Yeah, so <laughs> there's so many, right? Um, so there's, you know, the way I like looking at it, there's what you can do within the four walls of your organization and then right. beyond. So within the four walls, you know, it's really instilling quality processes. Um, because clearly, if you have higher quality materials coming in, and then your process internally has high quality, you're, you're better utilizing your resources, right? You're not mm -hmm. lever using capacity to create scrap um, right. or rework and so on. So, you know, that's often in supply chain isn't looked at as closely as it should be. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But back in the early part of my career, I did a lot of consulting. And, and, you know, that's where the idea of lean manufacturing and all the quality processes that came with it. But they were really focused largely on the four walls. Um, And I remember, you know, having a conversation um, with with somebody and they're like, you know, the next phase of improvement is really going beyond the four walls of an organization and now extending these processes to suppliers and and so on and and um, gaining a um, that trust and working collectively to drive quality and better delivery performance and reduced lead time. Um, But in terms of processes, uh, uh, you know, going back to supply chain planning, um, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I'm really a big proponent of now is leveraging machine learning um, where you can. So this isn't something that's really accessible to everyone, but it's becoming more and more accessible. So in the realm of demand planning, going back to this idea of you got a little more control, it's because, you know, with machine learning, you can leverage that tool and start bringing more external data in to help determine, you know, what your demand could look like. Right. Right. So if you have history and you're able to apply different related data sets against it. Um, this, and you could potentially have leading indicators as well. So leverage point of sale data. If you're in food and beverage, get the point of sale data, bring it in, throw it in a machine learning engine that generates time series forecasts and allow those, your shipment data to, um, you, you know, place it against the, um, point of sale data and help model out what that future would look like. Or Uh events, stock out, economic data. Uh, You know, there's so much data out there. It's just a matter of figuring out, you know, which ones make the most sense. And the beauty of machine learning is it helps really go through the process of cleansing and understanding what's relevant versus not. So that's sort of a newer, relatively newer idea that a lot of companies as well as technology providers are um, bringing forward to their customers to help them better manage the demand side to reduce error. And if you reduce error, you're you're able to provide more um, stability in your planning process that cascades Mm -hmm. its way all the way through the supply chain. Right. I love it. I mean, think there were some very, very good examples there of those processes, era. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm curious from a from a distributor standpoint. So selfishly speaking, here, Eco, we're distributors. So yeah. give us some advice. You know, where can it hit a distribution level where we can actively engage in solutions like you're like you're talking about right here and actually make an impact? Yeah, yeah. So uh, distributors are um, a really it, it in some ways it's easier than a manufacturing organization, but in other ways, it's really hard. So with a manufacturer, you typically have, you know, a set of products that you produce um, and there's clarity on where the customers are, who they are and, and what's going on. The sharing is it tends to be much more reliable. Distributors have a different problem um, in that, uh, company, you know, organizations like yours, you have a lot more products you're selling. Um, and, uh, understanding what is high demand versus low demand and then modeling inventory policies to ensure you don't stock out when the need is there is, is challenging. And, and I think distributors could really benefit from supply chain technology, particularly on the demand side to help size inventory appropriately, and also help you make the decisions on, you know, if I've got a very slow moving product, you know, should we, you know, how much inventory should we really carry for that? Because poor decisions on that front could create um, a um, constraints on your cash flow, right? Because inventory is just, 
your money sitting on the shelf. It's not doing anything. And, you know, there's about, I, I, you know, people argue, but probably I'd say about a 20% cost of inventory. And it's gone up higher as the cost of money goes up higher. That becomes worse. But you now have to insure those goods. You have to store them. If it grows too much, you may have to add warehousing space. Um, there's a lot of challenges. So um, software is super helpful in um, determining, you know, how much inventory should be carried by SKU, by location. It is a different type of demand planning um, question. So you could forecast against it. But in my view, it's more of a combination of using forecasting and inventory, historical inventory positions. And uh, there, there's an opportunity to apply machine learning there as well. Um, so, you know, companies that do it really well, you look at Amazon, right? Um, but one of the reasons why they provide um, have a all the data center capacity um, that they ended up selling, but they also have uh, like machine learning as well um, that can be made available not only for themselves. They built it for themselves to determine how much inventory they should stock. But a lot of this is also being now offered to customers and end users as well to help, you know, size inventory. Um, so, yeah, you know, th there's a lot of options there. But as I said, it it's really about optimizing your working capital. Make sure, you know, you're not tying up too much of your cash on the shelf um, and not treating every item the same. Um, right. Which is often the mistake. Everybody says, I never want to stock out. But, you know, there's a cost in that decision. That's true. I mean, it sounds like it's a big opportunity for inventory optimization there, but, you know, yep. working with these types of software solutions for sure. So um, thank you for that. That definitely that gave a lot of insight there as well. And when you start thinking about software, <clears throat> software and solutions and things like this era, what metrics, what are you measuring to know what's actually making an impact versus, you know, there's there's plenty of vanity metrics out there. But what are, what are the ones that actually matter when it comes to supply chain software? Yeah, so inventory turns is one. Um, you have to look at inventory turns not only based on you, you know how much inventory you have in the cell, but you have to take into account the lead time as well. Right. Because you may have an item that only turns three times a year, but it, it could have a hundred and twenty day lead time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So you better have yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have to size it based on that. So it, it's inventory terms, but done relative to the products um, to, to make sure that um, even if it's not turning well, it, it's turning relative to how quickly you can replenish the inventory. Right. Um, right. The other one is, you know, measuring stock out. So do you have how often do you have demand where you're not able to fulfill? Um, that's another metric because that immediately is telling you whatever you're doing from a stocking standpoint and inventory standpoint isn't good enough to meet demand. Now, right. sometimes you want to stock out because it's such a low volume that the cost of carrying that extra inventory isn't worth the margin that's generated. So I like looking at um, this margin contribution thing where you look at the cost of inventory. Um, how much inventory you're calculating, you know, you're carrying, and then use that and compare that against the margin that's generated. If it's, um, you know, negative, then you, you have too much inventory, right? You always want to have that inventory contributing to margin and not consuming it. Um, service levels, obviously, it's the other side of a stock out. You know, how often can you um, deliver on time and in full um, is, is another key metric. Uh, and if you're bringing in forecasting of any type demand forecasting, you want to measure forecast error um, because forecast error can be a really um, significant contributor to determining how much inventory you should carry. So the more accurate your forecasts become, the less excess inventory you have to carry in safety stock 
compensate for um, uh, you, you know the the natural uncertainty, variability, and demand. Okay, now, now the forecast era that, that's interesting. So how far back? I mean, how does that work? Are you looking back three months, six months? Yeah, is, is there... it really depends on your lead time. Um, okay, is the, the way I like looking at it. Um, so you can look at it much longer, a longer time frame, but often um, the forecast errors should be based on your lead time um, because okay. you want to make sure you're carrying enough inventory to meet that. But so we use um, something you could do like a lag three type of forecast error. And, and you can have it over a longer period of time. So obviously, the longer the horizon, the better, because you may have a short, um, like one period where you had a spike in demand. But what you're trying to determine is, on average, how has your planning worked? And when I use the term lag three or, say, lag four, it's really saying, if I've got a 120-day lead time, I'm really trying to predict further out in the future. So, and often your accuracy degrades the further out it you're projecting. Right. right. So it's much easier to predict what's going to happen next week or next month than it is to project six months from now. Right. Um, so looking at accuracy from that more longer term standpoint, taking into account your lead time is 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 the way to approach it. I mean, right. there's more to it than that, but, you know, for a quick couple of minute <laughs> explanation, um, look at lead time, apply lag measures um, and use that to help determine, you know, a lot of folks use something called root mean squared error, which right. is just basically looking at the average error o over that, that period. Right. But I mean, root mean squared sounds so much cooler, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 now, Aaron, when you walk into a, an industrial facility manufacturer and they're doing things the right way and you, and, 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 it's, and you can totally see these solutions working, what does that look like? What, paint, that, paint that picture for us when it's actually uh, things are, yeah. are, are, are moving in the right direction. Yeah, sometimes it's easier to answer that with if you walk into a plant, how do you know they need help? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so. I think what good looks like physically looks like um, is you walk into a plant. The first thing is, you know, is there are there piles of stuff everywhere? Right. The answer is no. That, you know, typically tells you again on the surface because you're just doing a surface review, you know, how, um, you know, are, are they organized or not? You can go to a machine, how much inventory is sitting there, raw materials is sitting in front of machine. Um, how is it organized? Is it organized in a very orderly manner? Are there, um, uh, you know, charts or video uh, like monitors that are showing performance and measuring performance? Um uh, you know, lights that signal when there's something. So this is where you're like from a lean standpoint, you're looking at and saying, oh, where is there an opportunity here or not? So, um, you know, good typically looks like you walk through both these places. You know, it's clean. It's like somebody's house, right? You walk in, everything's in its place. But they got it together. Now, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> It doesn't mean house. that you know, the day before wasn't a mess and they just cleaned things up. Right, um, right. But, but typically, you know, a, a manufacturing organization, even a distributor, um, you, you can tell when you walk in, are things in order or not? And, you, you know, a clean sort of environment and an organized environment usually is the outward facing um you know, presentation of a lot of good things that are going on behind the scenes that aren't as visible. Uh, so, yeah, I knew early part of it when I was consulting, that was, you know, the walkthrough was my favorite thing. And I, I used to be a plan manager, too. And, you know, they talk about the daily walk. Uh, there, there's that's an important idea, because as you're walking through, you see things. Right. And usually what you see 
could be a result of something deeper and systemic. Um, and you, you dig into that and understand, well, the why um, behind all of that and address it through whatever process, um, you know, a manufacturing execution system, a quality system, maybe modifying a procedure, even the simple step of how you release product to the floor um, and, and the next order, all those are connected to, you know, performance. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And, and you've been helping so many manufacturers implement these types of solutions. Ira. What, what are the biggest headwinds? I mean, if we, everybody likes to think, you know, things just go smoothly, but we know the real world, they don't. So maybe paint a, Give us some examples of headwinds that exist that it, so these manufacturers can get ahead of it and actually have successful launches of, of supply chain solutions. Yeah. Um, so what I see typically, especially in my area, it's um, having the right people uh, that can actually implement and and follow through and and execute. Um when you're when companies have turnover, what often happens is these systems end up becoming stagnant and and no one's using it because they're like, I don't have time to learn it. Right. So it really is that top down discipline to say these these are important and um, these systems are important. These processes are important. So we have to make the time to make sure people are trained on it. But more so, we also have people backed up and um, are also trained as backups. So if something happens to the primary person, a new person can can um, you know come in. So so that that's a, a a more tangible headwind that customers have to. I'm sorry, uh, manufacturers, distributors have to deal with. They need the resources. Um, the other one is. You know, interestingly, sometimes the more chaotic things come, people find it easier to just go to a spreadsheet, right? And say, there's so much uncertainty that, or, or they may, yeah, they'll, they'll go to a spreadsheet because it's easier. Um, and I can think of a couple of examples of companies I've worked with where ultimately these systems don't work if your data is bad. So if you're not, closing your jobs on time, you're not receiving inventory on time, you're not recording any scrap properly. If the underlying data is wrong, the planning and the entire um, the solution is 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 isn't relevant anymore because it needs the right data to make these decisions. So you know if you think you got a hundred units of inventory and you're planning your next order based on that, and the actual result is zero, you, you've got problems. So often that lack of discipline leads to moving to um, a manual system where they'll manually make these adjustments out of, say, your ERP. And over time, that may give you a short-term improvement, but long term, it'll fail because people will start making mistakes in their spreadsheets. So the same problem that occurred with not reconciling proper data is going to move its way into spreadsheets eventually, and then things will get out of control. So th those are some of the headwinds um, I've seen, you know, labor, uh, having things get so crazy that you, you um, move away from your discipline. Um, within the execution process, and then moving to spreadsheet systems that eventually break because they'll suffer from the same issues you had initially. Right. But, you know, spreadsheets are band aids. <laughs> I like that. Spreadsheets are band aids. There you go. Yeah. Well, this has been a ton of insight here on supply chain. Let, let, let's transition a little bit, Earl, and, and, and for this conversation. I definitely want to get our listeners to get a, a better understanding of who you are. So why don't you take <laughs> us to a little bit of your journey? Because, man, it's been it sounds like you've had a pretty incredible one. You said you're a plant manager and had a lot of different things going on. So walk us through what what what, hap, what led you to to Plex. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it is sort of an interesting journey. I, I think it's boring, but um, 
not too uncommon with how other people. So I actually started my my journey as a mechanical engineer. Um, okay. So I, I I graduated with an engineering degree. My first job out of college, I worked for Raytheon um, Missile Systems, um, so defense contractor, and um, really started off with a lot of like um, design for manufacturing. So you know, my role was focusing on packaging of electronics. And so you can imagine a missile, you're trying to put all this stuff in a very small package. So, you know, advanced packaging methods, printed circuit boards, um, all that stuff. Then I went, got my MBA um, after three years there. And, and, and I did that largely to, I was sort of interested in management and I wanted to get deeper into manufacturing. Um, so not from the engineering side, but the more on the execution side. And it it allowed me to work in manufacturing and it was a company in the suburbs of, of Chicago. Um, and we did this massive turnaround um, by implementing quality processes, lean, upgrading our equipment, moving to a new location. And I just learned so much about how you can transform a company. And I, I remember this is back in the um, early 90s um, that, you know, we when everybody was moving to China, we were one of the first um, automotive suppliers that were actually shipping to China from Chicago um, because we got so fast and achieved such high levels of quality that we and there really wasn't any competitor out there that could meet our our particular um you know, performance. Um, so uh, that that gave me the bug to sort of venture out, got involved in a consulting firm after that, learned about turnaround consulting and eventually started my own practice. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, the product I developed was the Mancaster. So it was part of the consulting um, I provided. And I was seeing as I was implementing processes to drive efficiency in the organization. But, you know, that was where, you know, a lot of lean methods require a, a level of predicting what's going to happen so you can size your combines and so on. And, and I realized back then that it's like, wait, you know, we've got long lead times. That's hard to do. Um, and, and a customer of mine said, yeah, I'd like to come up with this more automated way to size inventory. They were a distributor um, and sold direct to uh, like Menards and, and other um, companies like that, um, retailers, and <laughs> sort of was like started developing this and other developing, go, wow, this is sort of, this could be a, a thing <laughs> uh, and ended up spending more time developing that work with the customer that originally initiated. And they were like, yeah, you know, you can market this. And they gave me permission to um, go ahead and, and own the code and, and drive that forward. And that eventually led us to um, a point back in 2016, where we had partnerships with Plex and some others. And at that point, we're really starting to grow. And I decided at that point in time, you know, I need a little bit of stability in my life. And, and we were, um, you know, Plex acquired us and we've been part of Plex since 2016. So that's just a high level view. But it's allowed me to like see a lot of different perspectives, you know, from an engineering, from a plan manager, because I started in quality and then eventually became the plant manager of that organization and then went into consulting and saw a lot of different situations and um, companies and challenges, you know, all over the world and eventually led to the software and, and then Plex. So, yeah. Which which one stands out the most when you look back across it? Which one do you have the fondest memories of? Yeah, no, it's a, that's actually a good question. No one's ever asked me that. Um, I think it was, it's, it's probably two things, um, you know, going and working in that plant, 
um, mm-hmm. and starting off in the quality function and then working up, I, I think was really an important education for me um, yeah. because I, you start low and, and you were, and you, you see and experience everything really right on the floor. But then I, I think the most fun um, I had was probably early in the software portion, that excitement of building a marketing program. And, and we did the entire thing as software as a service. So, you know, back in t- 2007, when we launched this, you know, I took this attitude of, I don't want a lot of overhead. So I'm going to build the entire business virtually. Um, so, you know, and that was sort of at the beginning where software as a service was really starting to become a thing. Right. But um, we employed our, our accounting system was uh, a cloud application. Everything was cloud um, and it allowed us to be really nimble and flexible. And um, I could bring in people so that that process of building content, starting to make the sale and doing it 100 percent virtually was really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it was it was a lot of fun. It's just the excitement of yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever had any entrepreneurial ventures. Yes. Um, but yeah, it as you know, it's there's you, nothing like building something from scratch. Right. Because <laughs> right. I mean it's it's yours that we're and we're born to create, right? So I mean we're right. we have that that nature. So that I love that answer, man. So if you were to be now, let's let's take it a little bit further. If you could go back right now and give that 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 young entrepreneur some advice, what, what would you tell him? Yeah, that, that, that's a good <laughs> question too. Um, I, I think number one, um, don't be as cautious. I, I was very cautious, mm-hmm. um, and it was largely because personally, we had. My wife and I had three young kids at that time. And, you know, and, and I can't say enough. My wife was unbelievable through this process. She was she she helped work in it. But, you know, she gave me the permission to go out and take a chance. But yeah. I also think because you have responsibilities like that, um, I wasn't really willing to really extend myself, you know, mm-hmm. beyond taking a, a, a loan against the home and so on, which that in and of itself is pretty risky. Um, but I, I probably could have grown faster and been at a different point if I was willing to, you know, raise some more money or right. establish different types of partnerships. I, I didn't know that um, well. And then technology wise, you know, we made certain decisions to keep costs down that later on um, actually created cost because we had to go back and fix mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So I, I would have done that a little differently. Yeah. We probably yeah. would have been more willing to partner or, or get some trusted advisors and investors earlier on. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, build things the right way as opposed to, you know, keeping everything bootstrapped and, and as um, cheap as possible for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's good advice and it can be hard. I mean, it sounds like at that season of life, it's a lot of risk, right? So you have to manage that risk and, and, and. Yeah. It down. could have gone sideways really quickly. Um, but I always felt that, you know, they, they you can't, no one can take your education and your experience away from you. And, right. you know, I, I sort of, maybe it was arrogant, but I was like, if it doesn't work out, you know, I can always go back and, yeah. and work because I, I have the experience and maybe an arrogant way of looking at it. Um, but it sort of helped having the feeling that, you know, you had a backup plan um, and it allowed you know, me to continue to take that risk at the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing with that. I mean, and I guess one of the last questions I have around your professional career, and I do want to dig a little bit out with you outside of work, but when you have a really good day at work hour and you, and you've crushed it, you come home, you feel good. You, you got a lot of joy. What'd you do that day? What, what, what brings you that fulfillment? 
But yeah, that that's I think what makes me the happiest in the day is when you know, you know a customer or or someone comes on and say this has helped us in our business, mm-hmm. right? Right. Or you know they they're thankful for what you've shared with them and how you've helped them. Right. Um, that's typically where I feel the most fulfilled. Um, that by the end of the day, it's like, okay, we made a difference. All this effort that we've put forth collectively has resulted in something positive for a customer of ours, somebody that's paying us money to um, allow us, give us the the opportunity to help them. Yeah. Um, so I, I always, that that's what makes me feel good because it's all worth it at that point. That's right. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that that's the thing that makes the biggest difference for me um, personally. And when I end the day, though, oftentimes the day doesn't end until really late, uh, that you look back and say, yeah, we made a difference here. And, and I think that's true of any human being, right? Absolutely. Everybody wants to contribute in doing something positive in their in their lives that, that make a difference. Amen, man. Amen. Well, that's that's great stuff. Well, let's have a little fun before we wrap up today. Let's let's learn about you outside of work. So, what do you like doing for fun, Ira? <laughs> what do I like doing for fun? Um, so I I do enjoy. I, I'm a big music person. Um, so listen to uh, a lot of music, and I'm always looking for new bands or, or new sounds. Um, and, and discovering those that that's a lot of fun to me. Um, I used to play drums. I don't play drums as much as I used to. Um. But really, the other thing we, we I try to do is um, more <laughs> try to exercise more and and you know work out or run. Um, I run quite a bit, um, so so those are my release um, to get the tension out. And then the other thing, my wife and I, you know, we enjoy because all three of my kids they're they're older now. I've got only one in college. Um, my daughter is graduating master's degree soon so um you know we we watch a lot of like um like all the streaming services we got shows we watch together yeah, um, yeah. and that's sort of nice to just sort of sit down and veg out for a while <laughs> and, and just do something mindless for for a bit um and then the last thing is on my i i grew up in boston um so i'm i'm a, a rabid boston sports guy um um, my my favorite team was always the Patriots, which I know everybody's happy because they're not good now um, right. <laughs> for a variety of reasons. But the Celtics and the Bruins are awesome. Um, so I, I'm I'm a big like a uh, Boston sports fan. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I've been here since '91 <laughs> in Chicago, and I'm still a Bostonian. That'll never leave me. <laughs> You're a brave man. You're a brave man. I hear you. <laughs> Well, I mean, you can't complain too much. I mean, the run you guys have with the Patriots, oh come on, man. Uh, incredible, right? So, yeah. And and it felt good because I've followed them since I was a little kid. Um, and we used to go to the old, my dad and I would go to the old Schaefer Stadium, um, which was this terrible stadium at this time with aluminum bench seats and you know, sitting there in the cold and the rain watching this miserable team at the time. So, and then Belichick came and Brady came and, and just changed history. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. They, I mean, they're not good now. They, um, for a variety of reasons, which I'm not going to get into. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, they, they've been struggling, but some bad drafting and, um, yeah. You know, they Belichick and Brady together definitely had a magic that um they did. I, I don't I haven't seen another example of that in football in particular. Um, yeah. Ever, no. so. It would it would be a legacy, that's for sure. No yeah, doubt. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. Now, before we let you go, we like to do something with our with all our guests. We like to have a quick lightning round. Uh that that's usually a fun way to kind of get towards the end and then we'll wrap up with our why. So if you're good to go, we'll jump yeah. into our lightning round. Sure. All right. So, what's your favorite food? I feel. <laughs> um, actually, that's a t- 
I, I anything barbecued. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anything on a grill on, you know, that like that but that's my favorite. And, that's and your... it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. How about adult beverage? Uh beer. Any any brand? Uh not not in particular. Um so two adult beverages. I'm a big like um like trying a lot of different bourbons. Okay. And then beer, typically lagers, um, okay. are, are my favorite. Yeah, I'm not a big IPA guy. Um, yeah. It depends on the IPA. Now, what about your, what bourbon are you, uh, if you have, if you get one it's, bottle, where are you going with? Ooh, um, anything Scottish, um, true Scotch, oh, um, okay. is what I like uh, the most. But believe it or not, my my mainstay is a black label. So okay. <laughs> that's it's always in the house. Yeah. There you go. If there there's nothing go. else, it's a black label. Okay. All right. <laughs> so what's uh what's the favorite app that you have on your phone? Uh favorite app that I have on my phone. Um Yeah. Uh that's a that's a I, I'm I'm very limited in my apps, but I'm still a Twitter user. Um, okay, I, I'm there a lot, and it's been interesting with what's been happening these last you know month or so. Um, but yeah, I, I would say um, anything news um, related, and and I always try to find unbiased as as much as possible, and and get different points of view. Um, Right. So I, I tend to consume that and then sports apps. So you, okay. you know, ESPN is, is my mainstay there um, as well. There so. you go. Now, what's a, I'm, I'm sure you got to have one. What's a guilty pleasure that you have? Huh. I actually didn't think of that one. Um, <laughs> a guilty pleasure. Let me pass on that. I can't think of one. <laughs> okay. No chocolate ice cream in the middle of the night or nothing like that? Okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I would actually say probably my guilty pleasure in the end is probably having a nice drink in the in, at night and, um, you know, just sort of relaxing a little bit. Um, there you go. I try not to do that a lot. <laughs> at least once a week. There you Sit go. Sit down with a bourbon or a scotch. Yeah. There you go. Now, what's your all-time favorite movie? Um, and the one that has always stuck with me um, has been The Godfather. Um, okay. And, and I can't explain why, but the first one it is like my absolute favorite movie. Um, okay. And, and interesting, the other one that I always will go, if it's on, I'll watch is Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Okay. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> I, I do enjoy those too. Okay, and, and then any of the classic movies too. Right. Um, yeah, I, I just, I mean, we got a minute. So there was one movie that I had forgotten about, which most people will not know about. Um, but it's it's this movie, my favorite year. It, it huh. had Peter O'Toole. I think it's from like the eighties. Okay. Um, that just came up on like HBO the other day and I watched and I'm like, oh my God, I, I haven't seen this forever, but my I love this movie. And then I realized there was little phrases and things that I would always use and I had forgotten that's where it came that's from. That's where it came from. So yeah, it, it if you ever see it, it's it's a really cute movie. Um yeah, with Peter O'Toole sort of as he was a lot older older. Then you okay. realize how much he looked like David Bowie. And when I saw <laughs> that again, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, let's do let's do two more. Since you said music was a big thing for you earlier, what's your all time favorite band? Uh or artist. So I, I, yeah, our, my all time this is a bit of a top boss up. Um I like a lot of different music. Um, but from young age, I would say The Who was like my my favorite. OK. Um, and it still is. Uh, Zeppelin has always been my. So I'm dating myself. I, you know, I went to high school from 79 to 83. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that. Um, and then Nirvana, Radiohead. Um, you know, it's hard to pick. But if, if I were to say, you know, which one was had 
left the, the greatest impression on me was the who okay um, you know from a young age yeah nice nice love that band now so let's yeah. let's the last question here are for you dogs or cats dogs all right you got it right there's only one right answer and you got it right so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up with dogs we, we don't have one now um they're a lot of work uh, but i had two shepherds as, as a kid so i love dogs nice nice well this has been a ton of of, of of wisdom i've really enjoyed getting to know you and we always wrap up eco ask why with the why so let's just let's just go there so why should those manufacturers kind of going back to our, our main theme here today why should those leaders embrace software positively to impact, to impact their supply chain in the future? Yeah, because it in when you implement it and you get them working properly, they can be an in, enormously impactful um, process and and can really change a business for the better. And in this world where we have so much data coming to at us in rapid fire and there's so much change going on literally every day yeah, i wake up and there's something new that's creating a disruption somewhere if you don't have a platform to under consume that understand that and its potential impact on your business right um you're putting the business at risk so software is all about making the hard easier and driving improvement. Um, so don't be afraid of it. Um, and, it, you know, when you're looking at software, you have to look at it not only from a feature function, but also who you're partnering with. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that's the thing we're most proud of is we we really make ourselves available to customers that can put um, things in context and, and help provide guidance as to how best to leverage the, the particular functionality or how a combination of features and functions can provide the result they're looking for. Right. So, you know, that that's the what I would recommend in, in today's world. You need technology to help make sense of a lot that doesn't make any sense right Same. now. Absolutely. So. Well, where where do you want the listeners to go to connect with you to learn more about Plex and the solutions you offer, or just to connect with you directly? Where where would you like to send? Sure. Them? Um, so Plex dot com is our primary website. We're part of Rockwell um, now. Um, it's been a year now. We've been part of Rockwell, um, so we're we're part of the Rockwell family uh, of products and services. Um, but our primary website is Plex.com. And then the the product that I'm specifically responsible for is at Demandcaster.com. Demandcaster, um, so okay. that's very supply chain focused, supply chain planning focus, lots of great content there, blogs, other information that we recommend. Um, and then in terms of reaching out to me, you know, I'm on, I am the only Ara Serenian on LinkedIn, so I'm very easy to find. Okay. Uh, so that, that would probably be, you know, connect with me there and, you know, happy to have a conversation with anybody. Sounds great. We'll sync all that up in the show notes for you listeners. So Ara, is there anything else you'd like to uh, share with our listeners today? No, I, I had a great time. It, it was a lot of fun getting to know you, Chris, and having this conversation. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, I've learned a ton from you. Thank you so much for all the wisdom that you shared today, sir. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.